This tutorial starts by looking at the properties of polymers and how they relate to the type of uses that these polymers are put to. You may get an examination question that gives you a table of information about various polymers and asks you to choose the most appropriate one for a particular task. So you should be familiar with some of the names of these properties. For example, this polystyrene cup is made out of polystyrene because of its low density, which means it doesn't weigh a great deal for its size, and the fact it's a heat insulator, which means that uh, heat doesn't conduct through it very well. Climbing ropes are made of nylon because they're strong in tension. That means that they don't snap easily. They have a lot of strength like wires do. That they're flexible, they, they have to go around corners. And they're elastic, which means that they have a slight amount of give in them. Bed linen is made of polyester because it can be stretched to make fibres and that can be put through the uh, weaving loom. And also it can be dyed into different colours. Guttering on the site outside of buildings is made of PVC or polychloroethene because it can be easily moulded into different shapes and it's also waterproof and isn't affected by water. Whereas a bulletproof vest is made out of a special polymer called Kevlar because it's so strong and tough. The type of question that you'll get will probably ask you to evaluate or explain why a polymer is suitable for a particular use. You'll just have to think on your feet and don't mention everything in the table. Do try to choose those properties which are the most important. At a higher level you need to know about the properties of two particular types of plastics. Those which are rigid and those which are more flexible at room temperature. And explain why they are different because of the different types of forces that exist between the chains. You'll already be aware that there are two types of plastic in the world. There are those which are stretchy and flexible, and there are those which are hard and rigid. Let's look first at those ones which are stretchy and flexible. These are made out of long hydrocarbon polymer chains which are only loosely held together by weak intermolecular forces, here shown by the dotted lines. Now, when one of these plastics is stretched, the chains of the polymer move past or slide past the chains of the next polymer along and the plastic gets longer. Of course, when you stop pulling, the chains make new weak attractions between each other and hold their new shape together. Other plastics are rigid. And this is because when they form, the long polymer chains actually make strong covalent links or cross links between one chain and the neighbours. That means that these cannot be stretched because in order to pull one chain past another, we'd have to break these strong covalent bonds and that would take too much energy. These kind of plastics are used for rigid uses. For example, your work top at home made of formica or melamine will be made of a plastic that doesn't stretch and doesn't deform. And in fact, if you try to stretch it, it's likely to snap. That's because of these strong cross links which are made of strong covalent bonds, just as strong as those which are within the individual chains. It's also worth noting that these top polymers here have got low melting points and can easily be melted and changed into different shapes. For example, if you were to put your biro into a Bunsen burner at school and it would melt and then it would reform as it cools into a new shape that would just be as rigid as it was before. Whereas this second plastic, for example, the Formica worktop at home, will not melt if you put a hot pan on it, but it may char. That's because it's got this different structure where the chains can't move past each other. The remainder of this tutorial looks at new types of plastics which chemists have developed, those which dissolve and those which degrade over time. And also looks at some of those issues that have come about because plastics are so stable and we have to concern ourselves about how we deal with them once they've reached the end of their useful life. One problem with plastics is that they're so stable chemically that they don't break down after they've been used. One solution that chemists have come up with is to create biodegradable bags. These bags act just like ordinary carrier bags for the first few months of their life, 
but then when we finish with them and we throw them away, they simply rot away down to nothing in a matter of a couple of years. These four pictures illustrate four problems that have come about over the last few years. First of all, dog fouling is a real issue and nobody really likes to pick up that dog mess. People who work in hospitals have to handle soiled laundry, which then has to be handled again when it goes into the washing machine. Dishwashers use dishwasher tablets, but the tablets themselves shouldn't be handled because they're an irritant. And more and more people are using washing liquid, but the trouble is, how much do you use? Four solutions here, all of which use soluble plastics. The flushable doggy doo bags can be put down the toilet, the plastic will simply dissolve away and the doggy doos will go the same place as the human doos do. On the right hand side we have these water soluble laundry bags. That means that the soiled laundry only has to be handled once and the whole bag can be put into the washing machine, the plastic bag will dissolve and the washing will be washed without having to be handled again. On the bottom left we have a dishwasher tablet with a soluble plastic coating that will dissolve in the dishwasher and release the detergent. And finally on the right that washing liquid will already be in measured quantities in these small little capsules which will dissolve in the hot water of the washing machine. So we've covered a couple of solutions that will deal with the amount of plastic waste that we have, but how else is plastic disposed of? Unfortunately, we're all too familiar with the scenes like this, where debris that's been thrown out into the sea has washed up and spoilt the nice ocean shore. Much of our rubbish gets thrown in the bin and that gets taken to a landfill site like this one. But the problem is that plastics are very unreactive and don't rot away and they take hundreds and hundreds of years to deteriorate. That means that they take up an enormous amount of land in landfill sites which is a very expensive use of land. Cities like Nottingham burn a great deal of their rubbish. This is great because it reduces the bulk of the rubbish that goes into landfill uh, by as much as 90%. And it also creates energy that can be sold on to business and to heat homes. But the problem is it's bad because it can produce a great deal of carbon dioxide in the air and also it wastes a valuable resource that could be made better use of. Far better if we can to recycle our plastics. Here we see in the top left a collecting bin for plastic bottles. These get bailed up and crushed to make very small little granules which can then be melted down and reformed to make, for example, this camping gear. It's a great idea to recycle plastic because it saves raw material and that means that less crude oil has to be used to make new plastic. But it's very difficult to sort out each of the individual plastics into its own type of polymer. Finally, here's a past exam question. It says, look at the picture. These plastic objects are non-biodegradable. They're often thrown away and cause litter. Explain the problems of disposing of these objects in landfill sites. Well, one problem is that they don't decay for hundreds of years. Secondly, we might say they take up valuable land. We might say they are an eyesore. And finally, we might say they can harm animals and birds.